Thank you very much. And last presentation before lunch, so we're almost there, everyone. And thank you. I'm very excited to be here today and to be following up two great presentations. And I do think that the topic that I'll be speaking on really does build from the conversations this morning also. Some of it will be a bit of a review and a building on of the topics that were discussed already this morning. So what I'll be going through, first of all, we will again touch on the different wound types. And within those wound types and those most common types of wounds that we're seeing and working with, I'm going to talk about the cornerstones of care that need to be addressed beyond just the topical wound care dressings. From there, we will then go through the different dressing categories, what those different types of dressings are indicated for, and how to best utilize them. Within those different categories, we're going to be talking about them in the generic terms. So the broad classifications of dressings versus brand names. So if there are any questions at the end about specific brands, I'll be happy to answer them. But during the time, I'll be talking about them in, in um, specific categories. When I first started doing wound care um, about 12 years ago at this point, my mentor always made us not call those wound dressings by the brand name. We were not allowed to call that hydrocolloid a duoderm because she said, tomorrow our purchasers are going to switch our brand and we're not going to know what we're calling everything and we're not going to be able to write our orders. So it was the best lesson that I learned at my first hospital because we learned that a tissue is a tissue, not a Kleenex, and your copy machine is not a Xerox machine. So it was, it was really a great lesson that I learned, and it carries over to wound care exactly. So when choosing topical dressings, we have so many dressings to choose from. John mentioned this morning that, that Derma Sciences sells 3,000. I mean, there are literally thousands of wound care products out there from hundreds of different manufacturers. So how do we know what to choose? What do we even think about? Luckily, we are oftentimes restricted a bit, and that's a good thing because we don't have you know, excessive amounts of tools in our toolbox. We have to choose from what's in our toolbox. But hopefully, we have a little bit of everything to be able to help achieve our wound care goals. With the tools that we do have and the topical dressings that we do have, we do have to keep a couple things in mind that are extremely important, more so now than ever when thinking about possible litigation and when thinking about how our families and our patients now have the internet to be able to search for their own answers. We need to make sure that the treatments that we're providing are evidence-based. We need to be reviewing the medical literature and ensuring that everything that we're providing is truly having a base in that high-level medical literature. Things like peer-reviewed studies and uh, randomized control studies need to be supporting a lot of our wound care practices when that's available. And of course, we also need to be choosing products that are going to show outcomes. If we're using something, a topical dressing on a patient, and we're addressing all of the other issues going on with that patient, and that wound isn't progressing after two to three weeks, should we really be reevaluating re and choosing a new product? Probably. And when you look at the evidence, it's even telling you to maybe look at a little bit earlier than that. The data will tell us if a chronic wound is not healing about 15% in two weeks, you should evaluate your plan of care. That's pretty fast when you think about how quickly you, some, a lot of your patients are healing. 15% in two weeks is a pretty aggressive number. So we need to be reevaluating not only the quality of our wound care products, but also our patients and making sure that we're showing outcomes with what care we're providing them. So how do you short, sort through all of this theory and really choose the best products? That's what we'll be talking a lot about today. It's going to depend on your goals for that patient, on your goals for that wound. You may have heard the when you're looking at your wound care patients, don't just look at the hole in the patient, look at the whole patient. Extremely, extremely important because there's so many factors that we have to take into consideration that cannot always be directly addressed by your direct care to that wound on that any given day. Some of our goals may be based on that patient and what their outcome is anticipated to be. We've spoken a lot about hospice patients. Maybe our goal isn't going to be to heal that Kennedy terminal ulcer, but our goal is going to be to manage the symptoms of that ulcer or of those wounds. So we have to think about that. What are our goals for that specific patient? And then, of course, we have to think about the medical management that we may, again, not have direct control over. Is their diabetes being managed? Are they compliant with their medications? Is their hypertension being managed? Uh, are they having COPD and they're having a lot of lower extremity swelling and edema? We may not be able to have direct effect on these things, 
but the entire medical picture needs to be looked at in order to have an impact on healing those wounds. And of course, pain, psychological issues, and nutrition are extremely important. One of the major ways to first address a wound and help to it to heal is to remove what caused it in the first place. We can't necessarily take away a patient's diabetes, so we, we know it's a little bit challenging, but we know if it's a pressure ulcer, we're going to need to remove what caused that wound. And it's a good starting point, a good place when you first see that wound to look at it. You may not know what type of wound it is, but if you can try to figure out what maybe caused it, you can help remove that factor. Did that skin tear on their lower extremity come from an ill-working wheelchair that they might be fitted in? Perhaps you can then think about these things. So really thinking about what caused that wound in the first place, what type of wound is it, and then you can begin to think about how you're actually going to treat that wound. Along with this, of course, we're going to be going through the phases of wound healing. Throughout those phases, we're going to have different goals. Years ago, we did think that drying out the wound was the best thing to do um, and wet to, using wet to dry dressings. Now we've really shifted our thinking and shifted that paradigm from wet to dry dressings into the moist wound healing world. And even a step beyond moist wound healing, what we're really looking at now is this great algorithm of wound bed preparation. And I like to think of it as the time protocol because it really does take you through the steps of wound healing, but in a simple fashion. And all of these factors need to be addressed while you're choosing your wound care dressing. So if you look at your wound bed preparation here, uh, we've got tissue management as our T. This is very important because if there's necrotic tissue in that wound, there's slough, there's fibrin, we're going to need to be able to remove that in order for that wound to then be able to heal. So, infection management, an area at, at high risk, we need to think about not only um, treating that infection, infection potentially, but also preventing infections from occurring in those high-risk patients or high-risk areas of the body. Moisture management is key. We heard about if it's too wet, dry it. If it's too dry, wet it. And that's exactly what needs to be done. I, I usually use the terminology proper moisture balance because we cannot have excessive amounts of wound fluid or wound drainage sitting on a wound. It's too wet and that wound fluid is actually cytotoxic. So this proper moisture balance is so important and that's what allows for the epithelial edge to advance. Those epithelial cells at your edge do need that moist layer at the top of the wound in order for the keratinocytes to play leapfrog and create that new skin layer over your tissue. So very, very important. And your modern day wound care dressings can help you to achieve that time protocol. Tissue management, infection management or prevention, moisture balance, all the way through wound closure or your epithelial edge advancement. A few different patient cases just showing progression of the wound and we're going to come back to these at the end to think about different types of topical wound dressing options when you're looking at these patients but just quickly so you can keep them in mind throughout the, the discussion this first patient was in a long-term care facility and this wound started out as a deep tissue injury so initially it was a completely intact darkened purple area and um, you can see, I love this picture because sometimes it's hard to find a picture of a DTI before it's really, in, it's sort of in that in-between phase after, you're, after you know it's a DTI but before it's 100% hard eschar, this in-between point. And that's a great picture of a DTI sort of in these, those first few days and it can happen so quickly. So at that point, they, they did have to, they were topically dressing that. They had to decide what type of dressing are we going to start using to help manage this wound then moving on to becoming a completely unstageable ulcer. Of course, it was the damage was done down to bone as so often with our DTIs and dealing with that stage four pressure ulcer. And then as you can see in the end, it did end up turning out very nicely with a nice healthy red base. So we'll talk about the dressings they used throughout that process. This particular patient, it actually was a traumatic wound on a diabetic patient, and she had severe diabetes, long history of diabetes, non-compliant, and she actually had dropped um, an iron on her foot, so this was due to trauma. She waited it out, of course, didn't, didn't go to the hospital until she was having significant symptoms of a systemic infection, high fever, um, significant swelling in the foot. I don't know if you could see the peri wound erythema, admitted immediately to the hospital and started on antibiotics, surgery was consulted for a debridement for a possible amputation. 
and this was at admission. So they were really worried about her. The wound care nurse saw her prior to surgery getting in there, so she was able to start a really nice plan of care. And as you can see, she actually did go on to nice healing. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And then next, this gentleman um, was dealing with a squamous cell carcinoma, and he had a large fungating tumor with significant amounts of drainage. So that was really one of their issues here. You can even see some of that wound fluid actually dripping from the wound in this photo. So how do you manage these types of things? What types of dressings do you have available to you, and how can you help to address all of these issues that your patients are going through? A couple things that you'll be taking into consideration. Number one, Product availability, what do you have available? There's always the option of special ordering things sometimes, but really most facilities nowadays do have a fairly strict formulary. So what do you have available? Hopefully you do have a product in almost every category to be able to address the needs, but sometimes you're stuck with what you have. And costs, when your patient might be going home or perhaps is being treated in an outpatient center and they may not have insurance, or they may have very expensive co-pays, the cost is going to come into play. Co-pays for some pharmaceutical agents can be upwards of $100. Can your patient really afford $100 when they need a new tube of that wound ointment every three days? Extremely ex expensive for some of these products. Nursing time associated or the clinician's time for whoever is in there changing that dressing. Think about the time associated when you're in there changing that dressing three times a day because the physician has ordered a wet to dry TID. You know, the amount of time associated with that is, is ridiculous. There's so many other patients that you can be treating as well as there's so many better things that you can be using for that wound. So nursing time it really should be taken into consideration when you're looking at what products you're choosing. The psycho psychosocial support of that patient when that patient's at home, perhaps they're changing their own dressings, or perhaps they have a family member working with the dressings. What is their level of expertise and their ability to be able to change the dressing? Can that patient reach the wound that's on their lower leg by themselves, when yet they can't bend over to tie their shoes? So it, very, very challenging things that need to be taken into consideration. Uh, utilizing your resources. I mentioned earlier the patient with the skin tear on the lower extremity because it keeps getting caught on their wheelchair. Perhaps utilizing a seating specialist and your different team members within your facilities to help pull them in, bring them in. Okay, they may not know anything about wounds, but you figured out what's causing that wound. And you're now going to be the one that's going to be helping to heal that wound. So by using your resources, pull in other members of the team, make them take a look at that wound and have them help you work through a problem solving process to help address those issues. And then, of course, your laws in, in your practicing state and your laws of your, of your um, practice acts. What are you truly allowed to do legally? Oh, that's also very important. So what are the trends in wound care dressings? No more wet to dries is definitely a, a good trend. This is a good thing. We hung wet to dries out to dry many years ago. There still is a, we hopefully, however, I'm sure, as I know I do, still sees an order probably once a day at least. Um, but it is very important that we are moving away from that. Is there still a time and a place? Yes, there's a time and a place for just about everything in wound care, but it definitely shifting away from the most being at, at the most common dressing that we're using and really shifting to this proper moisture balance. A moist wound is a healing wound, and that's perfect because if it is too wet, you'll be running into issues, and if it is too dry, we now know that dry wounds do not heal as quickly as moist wounds. And then beyond that, future trends, what we're seeing is really even getting deeper into what's going on in a non-healing wound. Looking at the microenvironment of these chronic wounds, actually being able to do diagnostic tests in these non-healing wounds. Things like testing the pH of a wound. We know that a wound that's not healing has a high pH, a wound that is healing has a low pH. There's now ways to test for these types of things. Proteases are enzymes that break down protein, that we need some proteases to be active in a wound for it to heal, yet oftentimes in a chronic wound they're going crazy and overactive. There's now ways that we can actually test for these types of things. And there's dressings to help address all of those issues. So even if we may not have those testing availability to us quite yet, what we do know is that a lot of the modern wound care dressings have been built on the science behind those tests. So your modern wound care dressings can really help you with these chronic wound issues, 
even if you don't know exactly specifically what those issues may be. So you really can help to optimize the wound environment by utilizing your wound care dressings. This is just an example of a dehist surgical wound that doesn't look so bad when you're looking at the actual wound itself, except for the fact that it's a, now a wound and not closed, but look at the amount of drainage on this gauze dressing. And this was from less than 24 hours. So significant amounts of wounds fluid. When they did switch to an absorptive modern day um, adhesive foam dressing, it was able to absorb significantly more amounts of fluid than your gauze dressings and be able to maintain it intact for a longer period of time, decreasing the nursing time, decreasing the amount of um, resources that were then be putting into that wound care. As we spoke about starting off the morning, wound assessment is so important and that is really going to lead to every other decision that you're going to be making for that patient. Thinking about your wound bed preparation, starting with cleansing, extremely important. I'm not going to talk about too many different cleansers today, but it's such an important part of the wound healing process. And it sometimes it is, is overlooked. If that patient is not having significant amounts of pain, and if you can get in there and really clean that wound, you can start that wound, that first treatment, on the way to healing by removing some of that non-viable tissue, even some slough with just some, some nice cleaning when it's appropriate. Management of colonization, critical colonization and infection. Bacteria are everywhere, it's, they're all over our skin. But when it reaches this, a, an imbalance or a tipping point, that's when we really need to start to worry about it. And we're seeing that being called a lot now, this point of critical colonization prior to infection. We need to be thinking about these types of things. And then choosing our topical dressings. What, what the heck are we going to put on this thing? We have to put something on it. Where do we begin? How do we decide? A variety of different wound types can help you to decide a little bit, but more importantly, I really do think the characteristics of that wound, the symptoms of that wound, and what you're actually seeing that day are going to give you a much better idea of what to do. But for each wound type, there are certain things that do need to be addressed or else the wound will never heal. Diabetic wounds, very common. There are cornerstones of care for these types of wounds. Arterial, venous, pressure ulcers. Surgical wounds, whether it's an intact surgical wound or a dehist surgical wound, they're both going to have to be addressed in certain ways. Your traumatic wounds, you'll be treating as you're seeing them and how they're presenting. Areas of incontinence, burns. So while you are going to have your advanced moist wound care dressings available to you, if, those, if there's certain considerations not taken into account, you still may not be able to heal that wound. For example, with your venous ulcers, with your venous leg ulcers or your lymphedema patients, if you're not thinking about attempting to get some sort of compression on that limb, you're really doing a disservice to the patient because that wound may never heal. If you think about a patient that has such um, significant amounts of lower extremity swelling and edema and they can't even lie down to sleep at night. They're sleeping in a recliner but their legs are still dependent the whole time and they might have a little one centimeter by one centimeter open area on their, on their lower calf. That fluid needs to go somewhere. That fluid is going to continue to push out of that open wound and that wound is never going to be able to close no matter what dressing you put on it because that fluid needs somewhere to go. So you can help to address it by using compression when appropriate and also by doing things like having the patient ambulate, getting that calf muscle pumping, getting that fluid back up to where it belongs if, if when appropriate. Um, elevating the limbs can also work nicely for some of these areas. We need to address the whole patient and not always just topically what you're putting onto that wound. Underneath compression though, we do need to have a dressing. You still need to put something on that wound. So some nice options are some of our more modern wound care dressings because you're not going to want to be changing it every couple hours. It needs to be something that's going to hold up. So this is again just an example of a foam dressing, in this case taped in place on this um, swol swollen limb prior to a multi-layer compression bandaging being placed. With our arterial ulcers, little bit of a different mindset because with a patient that has arterial insufficiency there may not be enough blood flow getting to that area to heal it no matter what you put on it. So this is really one of the few exceptions where we may not be going for moist wound healing because if there's no nutrients or blood flow or oxygen getting to that wound because there's no blood flow getting there because of a blockage in the arterial system somewhere 
no matter what you put on it, it may not heal. And you may not want to moisten an area of dark eschar. You may not want to, um, you don't want to moisten a necrotic heal ulcer. And that's because if there's not enough um, blood flow getting to that area, that wound will not be able to heal. So you want to make sure that you are understanding of the arterial situation when you can find that information out. With our neuropathic patients that may have nailed their, their shoe to their foot, and, and you know we've all seen that, or they have the pebble in their shoe that they don't feel and they've walked around on it for 16 hours, and now they end up with a wound. You, of course, need to address that wound topically with the wound care dressing, but you also need to address the, the um, offloading of the wound. Diabetic wounds will heal when properly offloaded. There's so many, so much um, of our healthcare dollars are looking at ways to heal diabetic wounds, but in actuality, 90% of diabetic wounds will heal in six weeks when they are treated with proper offloading, which is the gold standard of total contact casting. So that's a great example of sometimes your topical dressing really doesn't matter that much. If you're, if you're following the thoughts of moist wound healing and you're providing that proper offloading, your patients can heal. And then pressure ulcers. Of course, we know that we do need to be relieving the pressure when we are looking at pressure ulcers. If we can't offload that patient, it's going to be extremely challenging no matter what you do for them to have that wound heal. I love this. Time wounds all heals. <laughs> so beyond those cornerstones, though, we do need to have something to put on that wound. We need to address the symptoms of that wound. And we're going to be choosing our dressing based on those wound characteristics. Some things, other considerations that we'll be looking at when you're first choosing your dressings are going to be managing that bio burden, using antimicrobial dressings when appropriate. I'm sure a lot of you use antimicrobial dressings every single day, and, and there's some newer thoughts on, on different antimicrobial types of dressings as well that we'll talk about. Obliterating dead space. Something that needs to be done whenever a wound has an area to fill, you need to fill up that space with something. So when you're choosing a dressing, you need to choose something that can fill that space. I like to try, I always try to avoid the word packing because I hate to see, I hate to think about someone jam packing a wound with, with gauze or packing strips or something. Yes, you need to fill up that space or else you can end up with issues at the base of that abscess, at the base of that tunnel um, where bacteria will then proliferate and could cause issues but you don't need to, to jam pack anything in there. Um, so fill the space is, is what I like to say. Um, and then you need something that's going to absorb drainage. Beyond just absorbing the drainage, preferably something that's going to contain it and lock it in. Because wound fluid actually could be cytotoxic. If you have a wound and you have a puddle of wound drainage sitting on top of it, that's gonna alter that microenvironment of that wound. It's going to change the pH, it's going to allow for bacteria to be sitting in that puddle and reproducing, and you're going to be altering that microenvironment. So you really do need to think about dressings that can help wick away that fluid, but yet maintain that moisture balance at the surface. You want to make sure that you are maintaining that moist wound bed. Providing thermal insulation. When we put dressings on, we want them to stay in place. We want them to stay in place to protect the wound, but also Temperature is extremely important in wound healing. Um, when you think about a dressing change, when you change the, that dressing on that patient, no matter what type of dressing it is, it takes more almost 45 minutes for that wound bed to return to the temperature that it was previously. And it takes three hours for your healthy cells to get back to that same temperature and for your fibroblasts to begin reproducing. So every single time a dressing is removed, you're taking away three hours of wound healing. And it needs to be done, it's very important, but it's just something to think about when you're, with how frequently you're changing the dressings. Temperature is very important, and dressings provide thermal insulation. The more modern dressings, more so than a gauze dressing. Gauze is going to allow a lot of that moisture and a lot of that temperature to be removed. Our moist wound healing dressings are going to maintain a more appropriate temperature, as well as protect our wound, protecting them from trauma and bacterial invasion. Um, and then, of course, Man it needs to be managed by whoever it is that's changing that dressing, whether it is a skilled wound care clinician or if it is that family member that you had, had to, three minutes to teach as the patient was being discharged. Um, so a couple things that we need to be responsible for, keeping that patient comfortable and decreasing their pain if possible. Another reason why wet to dries 
are no more. How painful is that when you're ripping that off of that patient? Even if it is mostly necrotic, there still might be areas of healthy tissue. You're pulling that off, you're ripping off everything good with it. Even if you moisten the gauze, it's still some of it's coming with it and it, it, it's unfortunate. Um, and cleansing the wound with every dressing change is important when that is your goal. You do want to be providing a cleansing for that wound bed. And you want to be choosing a dressing that hopefully will maintain its ability to stay intact. Very challenging in areas of moisture, extremely challenging, but there are ways to do it. When you're choosing your dressings, there are times where you only will need one, where it's going to be your primary and your secondary dressing all in one, and you can just place it on, and it could be, do a great job of healing that wound. But there's times where you're going to have to do a layering system. So your dressing that's intact with the wound bed, in contact, I'm sorry, with the wound bed is your primary dressing. Over top of that could be a secondary dressing, that could be an adhesive dressing of some sort, and sometimes you might even need a tertiary dressing, which could be something like a wrap that then will help to hold on the other types of dressings. So there are a couple categories that I'll go through today. Not really going to talk too much about wound cleansers or about the skin preps and skin barriers and skin ointments, but they're still extremely important. When you're using an adhesive dressing, it's great to be able to use a skin prep or some sort of barrier ointment at the peri wound to help that dressing stay intact a little bit longer, decrease how, uh, how, frequency, how frequently you're changing that dressing. Uh, antifungals, very common too, whether it's a cream, an ointment, a powder, whatever it may be, very commonly used in wound care. The categories I will go through are your gauze dressings, your contact layers and non-adherent dressings, alginates and hydrofibers, hydrogels, debridement agents, composite dressings, hydrocolloids, films, and foams. Beyond that, there's still many, many, many more. But when looking at the, the broadest category of wound care dressings, you can just about address most wound care needs with those categories. So, when looking at the first category, gauze dressings, this is the basis of our older wound care. Everybody uses gauze probably every day still has great uses. Um, they are, it's, it's cotton fibers, they do not absorb that much fluid. Cotton will absorb some, it's not going to absorb that much. So these are the dressings that maybe you know that for some reason it needs to, it's going to get changed again in three hours, well then maybe you would just want to use a gauze dressing. Uh, most frequently it is changed at least once a day. Sometimes it, you can stretch it out up to two to three days, but most commonly it actually is indicated for um, at, at, at the highest a 24 hour change. Could be a primary dressing. I would say more commonly now, we're using it as secondary dressings. You're using um, a primary dressing in contact with the wound layer, and then on top, you might be using gauze. And that, that could be a fine, perfectly fine usage for it. A lot of the time, when you are filling a wound with something, you might be using a gauze dressing. So you might be fluffing up your gauze and then placing it in to help obliterate some of that dead space. And it does, it'll, it'll, it'll fill it up, and it does provide some protection uh, against environmental contaminants, but probably it's that, that first step, our oldest type, our more, most ancient type of wound care products. Beyond that, we, when in, sometimes even in combination with gauze dressings, we might have a patient with a lot of pain and we might want to consider a contact layer. Perhaps it's an area we want to protect, like a skin graft or a skin substitute or a donor site that is extremely painful, a skin tear where we don't want anything to get stuck to it. So a contact layer might be very appropriate for these types of patients. Some brands you might be familiar with would be um, Adaptic, Mepitel, um, Zeroform is considered a contact layer. And these are your primary dressings that could come in contact with the wound bed. They could be impregnated with other types of healing ointments or medications, and then it will be placed directly against the wound bed. But these don't really absorb any drainage. They act as an intermediary between two other dressings. Most commonly, they're changed about once a day, but they could last for up to seven days, depending on what you're using in combination with these contact layers. They are going to prevent trauma and hopefully help to reduce pain at the time of dressing changes. So very commonly used on your very painful patients. Beyond that, we are very often going to have wounds that are draining moderate to heavy amounts of fluid. And this is when we would be using things like an alginate, a calcium alginate dressing, or a hydrofiber dressing. They fall into the same category as far as indications, so that's why I, I group them together here. And some brands that you may be familiar with are on that calcium alginate side are going to be Algacel, Caltostat, and then of course on the hydrofiber side, your Aquacel dressings. 
And alginates and hydrofibers are extremely versatile dressings. I mean, you can really use them in so many different ways. They come in all different shapes and sizes, ropes and squares and sheets and circles and, and about any type of, of dressing that you can possibly imagine these dressings come in. They also come in plain formats as well as antimicrobial formats. So you have some versatility and some choices there as well. They're going to help to absorb exudate, most commonly moderate to heavily draining wounds. They also can help fill up dead space. So you can also fluff up an alginate and place that in there. Once the alginate does come in contact with wound fluid, it's going to gel. And that's extremely important for our moist wound balance. We, we need something that's going to absorb that fluid, but yet we need to maintain that moist wound healing, that moisture, proper moisture balance. And these dressings can provide that. So very nice for that as well. And then they are indicated for either infected or non-infected wounds. And they will provide some autolytic debridement. The body's natural mechanism to debride is that form of autolytic debridement where um, our own leukocytes and our own cells will be breaking down necrotic tissue. Because an alginate provides that moist surface, it is going to help facilitate autolytic debridement, which is great. The change frequency as indicated is going to be about once a day up to four days. However, the more modern products can stay intact for up to a week. And with, with simple wounds, you often don't need anything more aggressive or more fancy than an alginate to heal. They're fantastic products. Um, and what, what you can do with them, these are just two examples. This is a, a dehist surgical site and then a, a toe amp where they were using alginate dressings with nothing in addition. They were um, holding it on with a secondary dressing depending on, on the location, a wrap or an adhesive dressing. And just having that proper moisture balance, the wounds are able to go on to closure despite the fact that there may have been other underlying issues. So something fairly simple that can still achieve nice wound care results. Hydrogel dressings. When you are dealing with a wound that's on the drier side, you may have to donate some moisture to that bed of the wound. And the hydrogel dressings are great dressings. They're water-based and often glycerin-based dressings that come, again, in a wide variety of formats. You may have it available in a tube. You may have it available um, in a squirt bottle. Uh, it, they also come in hydrogel sheets, which are, which are nice if you want to be able to place the dressing onto the bed of the wound. A couple different brands you may be familiar with. Uh, there's a Dermagran hydrogel dressing, Intracite hydrogel, Curacao, um, from all different, all different companies out there. But basically what your hydrogel is going to do for you is it will provide hydrating properties. It is going to help moisten that tissue and it will start to uh, jumpstart that moist wound healing. It's also going to allow for autolytic debridement again. So very important that you can help to, to really get things going with a very inexpensive simple dressing such as a hydrogel can be a primary dressing and at times it may even be used in combination or on top of other dressings. They can be indicated for everything from partial thickness wounds or stage two pressure ulcers all the way up through full thickness wounds and stage four pressure ulcers. So really a lot of versatility here and they can be used on those drier wounds up to more minimal to moderately draining wounds. There are some modern hydrogels that are now available that actually also have uh, super absorbent polymers incorporated with the hydrogel and they have the ability to absorb. So in those cases, um, one of the examples is the Extrasorb Hydrogel Colloidal Sheet. It's a sheet dressing but it has absorbent polymers. So you're actually able to use that dressing. It has broader indications than a traditional hydrogel because it also absorbs. So as time goes on, we're having newer and newer products come out based on what we know wounds need to heal. There's also um, products out there specifically for debridement. At this point in time, there's only one left on the market, and that is a pharmaceutical agent, which is collagenase Santil. And it is, um, it does come from pharmacy, so it does need, require that doctor's order and comes from pharmacy. And there are, as any medications, as you know, there could be indications, contraindications, precautions, and potential interactions of when that drug may and may not be active. Um, the enzymatic debrider currently available is not active in dry environments, so oftentimes they're recommending that you're actually using something in addition to it to help add some moisture. So you're, you need to think about having a, a combo therapy there, as well as this enzyme, as any enzyme in our body or externally applied, is only active in a very specific pH range. So that's something to think about. We, we most times don't know the pH of our patient's wounds. So enzymes are only active in a dry pH range. And um, with a thick eschar 
or a thick necrotic tissue, uh, it is recommended that that area is cross-hatched prior to application to allow the medication to get down into the necrotic tissue. Moving from debridement into more of the wound bed preparation realm is where the active leptospermum honey products fit in. They are utilized most frequently to facilitate autolytic debridement as well as for their antimicrobial properties. So a little bit multimodal uh, modes of action. Some common brands that you might be familiar with are the MediHoney brands and the Activon brands of medical grade honey. These are completely natural dressings made actually from honey, but a very specific type of honey uh, incorporated from New Zealand. So it's actually the plant that the bees pollinate in this specific region of the world that then carries over the medicinal properties to the honey. And they do provide debridement. They're going to provide that autolytic debridement as well as facilitating a gentle mechanical debridement because of the high sugar content of the products. They've also been shown in the literature to help jumpstart stalled wounds. This is one example um, actually from an acute care facility that they were using the medical grade honey products to facilitate debridement. This patient was in the ICU, was not stable to go out for surgical debridement, so they only were limited to what they can do at the bedside. So they were utilizing the um, active leptospermum honey dressings to help, to help meet their goals at that bedside while they were waiting for this patient to be able to be debrided. So he did very nicely. Over top of a lot of these dressings that we've talked about, you need something else, something else to hold it on, something else to cover it up. And very commonly, I'm sure a lot of you are using composite dressings. These are things like your all dress, your do dress, your cover sites might be a combination of two dressings in one. Most commonly, a combination of a gauze-based dressing with an adhesive-type dressing over top or in combination. Um, multiple properties very nicely used in combination with any of our, our goos and gunks that we're using to help heal wounds as far as that, and this is going to be what's going to assist with holding those dressings on. Could be a primary dressing in some cases, more commonly utilized as a secondary dressing, and your change frequency on, as indicated, is 24 to 48 hours. Hydrocolloid dressings, another one of our modern wound care dressings that has a bit more history than some of the newer ones. So our hydrocolloid dressings have been around for a while and they are um, great dressings to provide autolytic debridement and provide that moist wound healing environment. The, the brands that you're probably most familiar with are going to be your Duoderm brands, your Primacol, Tegazorb, and these are um, those the brown type of dressings that oh my picture's off here um, that are on that you're probably very familiar with. So they're actually a suspension of absorbent poly, um, particles in a water-based medium. They often contain gelatin, so there might be a bit of an odor associated when you remove a hydrocolloid. You might smell a little bit of that. That's because there is gelatin in the dressings, um, as well as pectin and carboxymethyl methyl cellulose, or CMC. So very um, commonly used, broad range of indications. Change frequency, on average, three days up to a week. So these dressings can be left in place. They can protect the wound. They do provide that optimal and stable pH range, as well as providing that optimal temperature range. Most commonly used on your partial thickness wounds and your stage two pressure ulcers. The only thing with these, they do have a tendency to sometimes break down in the wound or roll up a little bit. So sometimes removal is a bit challenging with, the, with your hydrocolloid dressings. Beyond that, when you're having a bit more drainage, your foam dressings are going to be appropriate for your moderate to heavily draining wounds. And foam dressings are very common. You might be familiar with Aleven, Mepilex, Extrasorb foam, a lot of the, the common brands that are out there. And they very frequently come in both an adhesive and a non-adhesive version. So a foam typically made out of a polyurethane foam layer. Some of the foams have additional products to layer in beyond that polyurethane foam, but that is what's pretty consistent with, with polyurethane foams. There also are foams that have a silicone layer or a safe tack layer um, against the surface so in order to prevent any type, anything sticking from your, to your polyurethane. They're all, they all look a little bit different. They're all different colors. These dressings also come in wide variety of shapes, sizes, different configurations. Indicated as either a primary dressing, completely appropriate to place it directly intact with the wound bed, or can be used in combination with many of the other products that we're utilizing. So, can be a primary dressing 
or a secondary dressing. Change frequency, as indicated, is one to five days. However, there are foams that are also indicated to be left in place for up to seven days. Here's an example of a venous leg ulcer. You can see the exact shape of this um, ulcer. And then here's an example of a, of a non-adhesive foam dressing in place. This was being secured with a wrap dressing since it was the lower extremity. And you can see that fluid getting absorbed up and through the foam. And you can see how with a more of a vertical wick in this particular brand, you're able to see where that fluid is. But significant amounts of fluid in some of these patients. And you want to think about choosing a dressing that's going to help hold that fluid in, especially when that wound might be under compression. Or it is a pressure ulcer patient that unfortunately they keep rolling onto that pressure ulcer. Or a, a foot wound that they keep walking on despite what you have educated them. So using dressings that can help uh, absorb that fluid but also lock it in are very important. And then on top of everything, we need something to help hold on these non-adhesive dressings if we're not able to wrap it. Or we might need something just to provide um, um, a reduction of shear or friction. And this is where your transparent film dressings may come into play. Some brands you might be familiar with are going to be your Tegaderms, your Opsites, the clear transparent dressings. These dressings do not have the ability to absorb any fluid. So if it is a wound that's draining anything more than scant amounts of fluid, you really would need to use this in combination with something else. But they work really nicely to hold on other types of dressings. You might be using them even to patch a type of dressing if, if a corner has become dislodged or if you just need a bit more adhesive in a very tricky area. Um, they're semi-permeable polyurethane films, non-absorptive, not, they're not adherent to the wound surface. Maybe that's the way that they're indicated. However, I, I'm sure you all have found that Tegaderms and some films in general have a tendency to get stuck to anything, including your, your gloves as you're putting them on. Um, and the change frequency is going to completely depend on what you're using them for. So it, it, they are indicated for up to one, up to seven days. A whole nother category of dressings that really encompass a little bit of everything I've talked about are your antimicrobial dressing categories. So these an antimicrobial agent can be put into just about anything that you see. Our military uses it in their clothing. Um, a lot of the public restrooms you go into in airports, you'll see the walls or the stalls are actually silver impregnated. You can put an antimicrobial agent in anything, including all of those other types of dressings that we've talked about. Most commonly, though, the types of silvers that are the types of antimicrobials you'll be seeing are your silver dressings, very often, your leptospermum honey dressings your iodas, um, iota, iodine dressings, um, and then also your polydadmac and AMD dressings or your uh, PHMB dressings. So the brands that you might be familiar with, as far as some of our silvers and the most well-known are going to be things like Aquacel AG, Algacel AG, Actacope, uh, are your, a lot of the most commonly used silver dressings, but everybody does have a silver. And then also, there's antimicrobial gauze products available. You might be familiar with the AMD brand, and that has an active agent called PHMB. It's a cationic biocide. There's also a brand called BioGuard gauze dressings, also consisting of a cationic biocide. It's going to help disrupt bacteria. just works a little bit differently than the PHMB. And then the iodine dressings, most commonly iodosorb and iodoform. So you might see those as well. And those are also indicated for your anti, um, as an antimicrobial dressing used as, on wounds that are infected. Most commonly, you're going to be using these on wounds where you know that there is already a high level of bio burden. You're at that point of critical colonization or infection. So you really are not always using these for prevention. There are certain types that are indicated for prevention, yes but they're really trying to steer away from this more. Um, the World Union of Wound Healing just put out guidelines on antimicrobial dressings, and they are really saying two weeks of using an antimicrobial, and if you're not seeing a reduction in that, you might need to think about shifting away from it. And they are only specifically recommending certain types of antimicrobial for prevention, and silver is not one of them, and that's something that in this country still, we're using a lot of. Other countries have gone away from it already, and, and you're seeing other things as a first line of defense. Not all are safe for prevention. When you're choosing a, dress, a dressing to prevent infection, you want to think about something that is not going to create drug-resistant strains of bacteria because we don't need any more issues. We already have all of the issues we have with antibiotics and antimicrobials. And you also want something that's not going to be cytotoxic to your healthy cells. 
If your goal is to be healing a wound and you're just trying to prevent infection, you don't want to be applying something that actually can be damaging those cells. Things like Dakin solution still absolutely has a place in certain types of wounds and certain indications. However, it's not something you would ever use for prevention. It is cytotoxic to your healthy cells. Many, many factors to be considered when you're using antimicrobials, but really important. Um, with a gauze dressing change, there are li literally thousands of cubic meters of bacteria that are thrown into the air when you remove a wet to dry gauze dressing. So we're all breathing that in, it's being exposed into the air, and it's actually living in the air. Certain types of bacteria up to seven days on flat surfaces. It's kind of disgusting to think about, but there's also options out there that can help reduce some of these things, and that's where our antimicrobial dressings are so great. You're not having that being thrown into the air when you're removing an antimicrobial dressing because the bacteria was absorbed into that dressing and destroyed. So this is just a visual example that I like. This is a traditional gauze dressing where you're seeing that bright green classic pseudomonas drainage and then, um, even though a silver dressing actually was underneath here, but over top of it, it, once it gets past that layer, it's hitting that gauze, that gauze isn't doing anything to kill that bacteria. So that's an example of your, of your classic pseudomonas, but yet when you switch it to an antimicrobial gauze product, you're having that it, it maintaining that white look, and that's because the bacteria is being killed on contact. So in a case like this, where you might be trying to prevent infection, um, very often in the home care environment where there may be pets and animals, it might not be the most clean environment for that wound, you wanna protect that wound from the outside world just as much as you're protecting the outside world from that, the, the bacteria within that wound. Some of our antimicrobials are also used for odor reduction. And in addition, there's some other agents out there that are uh, used for odor reduction. Such a huge challenge and such an impact on the quality of life of our patients when they have a highly malodorous wound. And some different types of dressings that I won't go into too much detail, but your charcoal dressings can offer an option to help reduce odor. Honey dressings have been demonstrated to reduce odor. Um, a lot of your antimicrobials may help to decrease that bio burden, which in turn can help to reduce odor. And then a lot, we often are using our antifungal, uh, whether it's a powder or a cream, for, to help reduce odor as well. And then within the world of our medications, in addition to everything that we're topically applying to the wound, they may also be taking systemic medications for their wounds. Systemic antibiotics are a great example. Um, systemic steroids, sometimes if someone has an autoimmune disorder and an inflammatory process in their wound, they might have to be on medications for things other than just specifically treating that wound. Or we could have medications that we're applying topically. Very often we're still seeing topical antibiotics, things like bacitracin, still ordered for wounds. Bacterban, still ordered topically for wounds. So, you know, some things that I think we'll start to see less of that coming down the road because of the issues that we have with drug resistant bugs. And we do have more modern things available now, such as our, our silver dressings. So we're gonna see a little bit more of a shift away from that, but still very commonly done. The nice thing about those um, is that they do provide a moist wound healing environment. So you look at this, the commercials on TV for Neosporin and how it heals in seven days, and it actually isn't necessarily the, the active ingredient in there that has been proven to heal. It's the fact that you're keeping the wound moist. So that's why it's healing and with less pain, and, and that's proven in, when, you, when you dig into that literature, which is really fascinating. Um, and then also when you are using these topical antimicrobials, though it is very important that there is a specific reason why it has been ordered. If you know what bacteria strain is in there, you're choosing a topical uh, antibiotic that is going to specifically address those products. And then beyond the scope of, of today's talk, there's so many other things that you're seeing probably every day too. Negative pressure wound therapy, how commonly are, are we seeing that? Um, some newer types of dressings that are dressings you're actually placing on but have active components, um, almost like a battery pack, some bioelectric dressings. Other types of modalities you might be seeing and using, e-stim, ultrasound, um, different types of hydrotherapy. Other types of advanced dressings such as skin substitutes and different types of um, skin membranes from different animal suspects are different even made in a laboratory at this point in time. So other really interesting things that are out there. And then maggot therapy, I always have to put up there too since it is, it is very nice for debridement but just not as commonly done because of some of the other issues associated with it. So going back to our patients from earlier on, and we've just got a, another couple minutes here. Um, this was our patient with our 
Originally, it was a deep tissue injury progressing through to a necrotic ulcer here, very commonly with your, your whitish tissue showing up and then will eventually turn into a completely 100% necrotic, unstageable ulcer. This is obviously after it has been, hadn't been debrided out. So looking at this now, thinking about what types of options you have available, what types of products you've had available. Um, they you know, were trying to, this was actually a gentleman in long-term care, was on hemodialysis. They were trying to keep him in-house. They didn't want to be sending him out to the wound center for debridement. They didn't have anybody in-house that can use debrid, that can uh, do debridement. So they were using products. Their goal for this gentleman was, we need to get this wound debrided. We need to figure out how deep this is, and then we can work on healing it. Thinking about that time protocol, tissue management was so important between here and here to start to facilitate debridement. So they were using products to jumpstart debridement, and then once they got to this point where you have a 100% granulating wound, you really can use your moist wound healing dressings, managing all those other factors, making sure he's on the right mattress, and then really just take that wound through to closure as much as, much as you can with some modern day moist wound healing dressings. With this patient, their initial goal was we need to treat this infection. So they started her with her an infection um, on the antimicrobials and antibiotics, and the wound care nurse said, well, we're starting this right away with our antimicrobial dressing. So they were using a topical antimicrobial agent that also was able to facilitate some debridement, and then once they cleaned it up and they got a healthy granulating bed, they then were able to take away that antimicrobial dressing and then follow through to wound closure with moist wound healing. And then our gentleman with the squamous cell, this, this one was just amazing. During this time period, he was undergoing chemo and radiation, of course, to treat the cancer, but the wound care nurse was trying to treat this wound. I mean, there, she's dealing with this uh, fungating tumor, which did have significant amounts of odor and just vast amounts of drainage. So she was trying to figure out, well, how am I going to treat all of these things at once? So what she was doing was taking um, actually, in this case, it was the, the honey alginate rope and was wrapping it around the, the tumor in order to help absorb some drainage, but also to help um, reduce that odor. And then they were, over top of that, applying a super absorbent polymer dressing, and then they were um, securing it with a band net or a surgy net around his neck and around his face. And then as time progressed, actually it was a fairly short period of time, that wound was able to be debrided and cleaned up, and he did go on to complete closure. So with our wound care patients, there's so many different options available, and honestly, there's never one right answer. You, as long as you're doing your, your um, proper wound care treatments, using the dressings appropriately, using them how they're indicated, and backing up your reasoning for these dressings with your documentation based on your assessment, you probably have a right answer in your hands. So you really have a lot of different options, and you want to just make sure you're using high-quality, evidence-based wound care products, and your institutions should be able to assist you with that. And making your decisions not just based on the type of wound, of course you need to be treating the wound and treating that whole patient and having it managed medically, but treating the characteristics of that wound. If it needs debridement, debreed. If it needs bacterial management, use an antimicrobial. If it needs a moist wound healing environment, you can use a very simple moist wound healing dressing and you may be able to achieve the results that you're looking for. So, that concludes my portion. <laughs> and so, And she barely took a breath. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell I'm from the Northeast and I'm like, <laughs> normally. I, 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 um, okay, so some questions here. See, today you made more of us. You do, do you see today more of a surgical debridement initially, even though they. Okay, do, do today, do we see more of surgical debridements initially, even though there are agents that can debride also? That's a great question because I think it depends on what care setting you're in because. Yeah, I, I'd say yes, most of the time you do, because, I hope there's no surgeons in the room, because surgeons are surgeons and they want to do surgery, so and that's what they get paid for. Um, but no, it, it depends on the wound. You do need to be able to, if you have a patient that is systemically infected with significant amounts of necrotic tissue, you need to be able to, to, to get that out of there aggressively and quickly, and a surgical debridement is the absolute fastest way to do that, by all means. Now, do we see some other types of surgical debridements, perhaps in wounds, that topical agents would work on? 
we do see that. And, and we are trying to shift that paradigm. And with healthcare, with the changes we're seeing in healthcare, where people won't be getting paid for doing the same thing over and over and over, or now we're actually going to maybe get paid for prevention a little bit, or at least we need to be trying to prevent things, um, we are going to, I think, start to see a shift where somebody cannot keep being surgically debrided over and over and over and over. And we're going to need to rely on some of our topical dressings. And there are some out there that do a great job. So with those wounds that you don't need an aggressive surgical debridement, there's options out there, absolutely. Okay. Okay. Would you use a polyurethane foam dressing with ABDs with massive drainage, and does this allow for airflow to the wound? Um, you may, depending on what type of foam you're using. So, some foams work in the means that they need to have what we call a moisture vapor transmission rate. So you actually need to have evaporation out the backside of a foam, certain types of foam. So if you were to layer on ABDs over top of it, you're going to be losing that evaporation. So you may actually not be getting a benefit in addition. Um, and actually in those cases, you might be better off just using the ABDs because you're using a foam dressing that's going to get compressed by all those ABDs and it's going to act as a sponge. It would absorb the fluid, but it's going to then be squished back out. It's not going to have anywhere to evaporate, so it's going to get pulled into the ABDs anyway. So it, with those situations, it, it, it is a little bit tricky, but it does depend on the type of foam dressing you're using. If it's in a foam dressing that has um, more of a, a less, it relies less on that moisture vapor evaporation rate, then you might be okay if, if it was only you're putting the ABD over top just in case it was to get dislodged and it was all, it was, um, you needed excess drainage sort of in the peri wound area. Then you might be okay to do that. Okay. DTIs, debridement with the DTI. When do you allow it to heal from the inside out and when do you start debriding? I don't know if this answer is known yet, but I will tell you what, what I had done in my practice and what most commonly I'm seeing out there uh, now as I'm in a couple different facilities. Once the DTI has gotten to the point of no return, once the DTI, the skin has opened, there's an open area, there's some drainage, you, may, you technically have an open wound now, that's at the point where I'm seeing people starting to treat it, starting to use a debridement agent, starting to perhaps refer out to get a, a debridement because you know it's going to be necessary sometime soon, um, and to start using, going more towards your moist wound healing. Prior to that point, what I'm seeing is the protection and um, obviously removing the, the pressure that caused it in the first place and sort of waiting to see how it, how it shapes out. Because there are times and there are some things you can do where it actually will shrink and you'll have less of an area affected. So that's what I'm most likely seeing and I, I don't know if anyone else is, is seeing a lot of them, if they're seeing anything different or if that's pretty much what people are doing for DTIs. Is that pretty much? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. So using Xenoderm or a vasodilator has been shown in, in some case series to really do a nice job on DTIs. Um, there's also modalities that you can use to help get some gentle blood flow back to that area and you can help reduce the size. That's, thank you. Okay. This is a long one. Um, pain and pre-medication Okay. So in a venous uh, stasis ulcer, do you need to remove the leftover alginate on the wound bed after cleaning the wound? The patient is still complaining of pain in spite of pre-medication prior to the dressing changes, but I still think of infection. Okay, so with an alginate dressing, an alginate is technically a natural dressing. So if there were little teeny tiny fibers that were left in place, they would end up breaking down and would not necessarily need to be removed. That being said, if it was anything where you, that you're actually able to visualize anything large enough, it could still be seen a little bit as a foreign body response and it, it could create a little bit of, of an issue there and potentially infection could also be a concern. So it is best to always cleanse and remove 
every portion of dressing that you can. However, an alginate is a bit of an exception because the little, some little fibers may be okay to be left in. Um, it, sometimes also what, what could be done if there's an area or if it's somebody that's having such significant amounts of pain, it would depend on when you're going to see that person again or when that dressing is going to get changed again because if you can then make sure that it's moist enough, the next time you come back, it might come off that next time. As long as, you know, maybe if, if somebody's going to be there the next day changing it, you might want to just donate a little bit of moisture to that wound bed that following day, it all may be able to be removed in a much easier fashion. Oh, oh, the, oh I love this one. Oh, I have a good story. Okay. How do you initially manage a wound that is um, filled with maggots from the environment? So not, not our sterile wound, wound debriding maggots, but our, our medical grade maggots. So, when I, was, um, when I was practicing, I was in the Philadelphia area, but one of my favorite hospitals was this little community hospital in West Philadelphia. We used, all, all summer long, it was like, call PT wound care because there's a patient with maggots in the ER. I'm like, why don't they call surgery for that? They call them for everything else. But, so now, so we needed to address these. Um, the only thing that is actually um, used to kill a maggot is ether which is extremely hard to access, and when you can access it, they only give you a very, very tiny amount. So what we've done, and what I've you know, found and found is everybody gets creative with how they remove maggots. I'm sure some of you have some great stories. Um, I've done everything from using just a, a dampened Dakin solution with, um, with gauze to just try to cleanse them and remove them. I've used, I had, um, a, a patient I'll never remember, you can remember what room, one of those patients you'll never forget the room either, a morbidly obese patient that literally in a skin folds of his entire backside were filled with maggots. So we put on our, I got gowned and gloved and shoe covers and we brought in a, a portable suction machine and we vacuumed these maggots from his entire backside. So. That, that was one, and it worked. So that was a really, that was one that worked really nicely, and then we just were able to um, dispose of it in the biohazard. So that actually w worked out really nicely. Um, but typically, a lot of times what we're doing is um, uh, using just, a lot of times I would soak it in Deacon's, I think just because the smell helped me a little bit, um, and it, mentally, and then, but, it, but nothing actually kills, kills them, so. Ether. Is there anyone else? Thank you, okay, Marcy. thank you all very much.